Welcome to Become Famous Podcast, the ultimate destination for achieving fame in your industry. Join us for discussions as we uncover the strategies and secrets to becoming known, navigating cancel culture, and staying authentic. Stay tuned because here at Become Famous, the journey to fame begins now. Welcome to Become Famous, and I'm so excited to have Catherine N. Wilson, who is the founder and director of Stop Trafficking US, and she has done some amazing work for 12 years. She did this before any one of us really paid attention to that kids are being exploited, that Center for Disease Control basically stating that the most important thing right now to focus on is children's mental health. We got the Homeland Security for the first time is seeing that the number one issue is exploitation of kids. Wow, Catherine, you've got a lot of things to cover and to manage. And <laughs> how have you done it all? And, and how have you seen the progression of this issue? When I first started, um, I, I am a survivor of abuse myself. And the first 20 years of my life was um, dealing with surviving abuse. Like, how do you survive while that's happening to you? Lots of confusion and like, why is this happening? And and then the how do you survive what's happening to you? So that was the first 20 years. And then the next 20 years, I call it surviving the surviving. Anybody who's gone away to war knows that when you come back from war, that's when the real hell begins dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder, night terrors, anxiety attacks, panic attacks, all that stuff. So now you're you're healing, you're doing self-help and self-growth. So what you didn't learn early on, you have to learn it sometime. So that's where the self-growth comes in. And then I was um, growing in my career and had a wonderful six-figure income and bought a little house on a, my dream to own a little house in the woods of Maine on a lake. And I wanted to do some volunteer work. And I've, I've always done some sort of giving back, but never with kids, certainly not kids incarcerated. And at 47, I, I took that on. I was volunteering at a local juvenile detention center on the girls unit. And it was shocking to me that every single one of the girls that I was working with had all been sexually exploited. And I was like, wait a minute, I, I live in this Norman Rockwell state of, of Maine. And uh, if this is happening now, like what happened to me, you know, decades ago is happening now, that must mean that people here don't realize it's happening. Because if the people in Maine realize, I mean, they're abolitionists by nature. Like if they really knew what was going on, they would put an end to it. So they must not know what's going on. So I went out into my community and I joined different groups and I wanted to understand like who's doing what and, and what's working and how come this is still happening. And, and when I did my vision as a short, old, tenacious national sales leader at the time, it, you know, I don't have time for a meeting and a meeting and a meeting to have a meeting. And, and, and they're, they're effective in their own way. The different organizations, they have their role to play. But I felt like something was missing and I could fill that missing piece. And I believed it was education, that if people were effectively educated, they would intervene and put an end to this child abuse, which is the precursor to trafficking, to suicide, to kids dropping out of school, to like like every, most every awful thing in any community, if you follow it back to its root, its root is child sexual abuse and neglect. So if I could stop that from happening, if I could stop that precursor, then we could really make an impact on our future. So um, I joined a couple of groups and I said, no, this is, I, I need to do something different. And so I started what I called Stop Trafficking US because in 2014, 2015, that was the hot topic. And I'm, I don't know if you're old enough to remember, but back in, in my day, if you had a black friend, you know, a person of color, you were really cool, you know, if you had, and then it was in the eighties, it was a gay friend, right? And right. so in then 2014, 2015, some of my new friends were calling me their sex trafficked friend. 
this is Catherine, my sex trafficked friend. And I'm like, oh my gosh, here we go. But that, so that was, that was the key that would get me in the door. And once I got in the door, I was able to say, hey, stop having sex with children. And here's why. And if you're motivated by morality, here's the reason. If you are motivated by money, here's the trillions of dollars that's going out every year because of sex trafficking. If you're motivated by your own children, then here you need to know that one in five children, one in four girls, one in six boys are sexually molested before they're 18. And 89% of the kids who end up sex trafficked were sexually abused first. So if you want to save your kid, here's what you got to do. So that sort of got the ball rolling and, and right out of the gate, a um, lot of churches, because sex trafficking was the hot topic, churches were, um, they were showing, they were having like movie night and they were showing this international 45 minute video of all of sex trafficking. So sex trafficking is the trafficking for labor um, organ, like organs of your body and sex. So they were, and they were doing just national, they were doing international. So all the little church people would come to see the, the hot topic and then they would be followed by a panel. And what happened was they show the movie, all everybody's chitting and chatting, and then they show the movie and they turn the lights on. And then there's a table of people like me and Homeland Security and local district attorney's office. And you look at the same you know, talkative, chatty, Kathy people who walked in after the movie, lights go on and the oxygen had left the room. Like everybody was just traumatized by what they saw. And I'm like, how in the world am I going to get through to them why they shouldn't have sex with kids and uh, wh what prevention looks like when they look like zombies, right? And so I told the starfish story. Do you remember the starfish story? Yes, but you should tell it for our listeners. So the starfish story, I love Pippi Longstocking and I love Maine. So I imagine that this grandmother has this little girl like Pippi Longstocking who is visiting her grandmother on the beach. And after a full moon and an astronomical high tide, the little girl is out there and the, the whole beach is just littered with starfish, some bigger than her hand and some so tiny it could fit on the tip of her finger. And she's picking up starfish and throwing it back in the water and picking up another one, and throwing it back in the water. And here comes this cranky beach walker guy and he's like sweetheart go back to your grandmother's house the tide's gonna rise it's gonna take everything away there's nothing you can do they're all gonna die this is no place for a little girl go back to your grandmother's and the pippy longstocking type of of girl looks at him doesn't say a word just bends down picks up a starfish flings it into the water looks up at him and says it mattered to that one so I was able to tell this audience who had just lost all hope, wanted to go home and eat a pint of Ben and Jerry's ice cream and forget that they ever saw the movie, that they didn't have to save the world. Wasn't their job to save the world. That if all they did was do their own healing work so we don't perpetuate generational trauma, and then after that, if they just became a safe place for their children and they had the difficult conversations within their own family and then their neighbors and their coworkers, that opportunities would just naturally happen to come, would just naturally cross over their path where they could make a difference. That that's all they had to do. Then they came back alive again because they had hope. And so you tell the awful story and you reveal the awful statistics and you, you expose the realities without devastating and overwhelming everybody. And then you give them the how to's and you, you give them the script. They would always ask me, what do I say? What do I do? And so I would go out and I would find national leaders who are the best people in our country who are educating teachers. Who are the best ones to educate law enforcement? Boy, our, our, our law enforcement and first responders have a lot of vicarious trauma. 
if I want them to protect our children, then I need to give them the tools and resources to deal with vicarious trauma. Who's the best people out there for vicarious trauma? Bring them in. Hey, our kids are sharing sexually explicit things with their phones, like online, like they're being sexually exploited and they're also participating by sharing these pictures. So who are the best educators to explain why they shouldn't do that and help parents understand why they need to use the parental controls? And then I would bring them in. So I would fundraise in order to afford these various experts. I would bring them in for the different groups in my community and then I would offer that to my community free of charge in hopes that we can stop children from being abused and we can empower our first responders, our teachers, our social workers, so that they can keep their, their heads on. I mean, the suicide rate of correctional officers, of social workers, of law enforcement has just gone through the roof. Suicide rate has never been higher. What do you think that is? So, like, if you've looked in for your twelve years of working on this, yeah, what what, are you just seeing? It's getting worse and worse, or do you feel like the people that are throwing the starfish into the water are making some difference in the community? At least in my impressions of knowing your work, it's made big differences. You've made, you've had some major conferences. You worked with the Homeland Security. You've been to the White House. You've really been able to be a voice on this do you see that possibly right now we have this awareness where it really looks dark but we've really made ourselves better or are you just seeing it's getting worse i'm an internal optimist so so, um statistically we have never been worse than we are right now and a lot of that is because of the internet you know before you needed to be careful of, you know, I mean, you would never take your your children or your grandchildren or your nieces and, and nephews to, you know, the worst part of town and go to a park, a play area in the worst part of town in the worst city, you know, in the middle of the night and say, here, play, you know, you wouldn't do that. Um, but that's exactly what you're doing when you put something without parental controls, a tablet, a phone, something within your own house. So it used to be that predators or offenders were some, you know, were somewhere. And now we realize that they are in your family. They are youth and and they're people who work with children and they have access to our kids through this thing that we never had. Like we didn't grow up with iPhones and computers. This is the first generation that they have grown up, grown up into adulthood with online internet, access to everything. A child's first um, sexual contact, or not contact, or experience is on their phone. Boys are learning how to be intimate with girls on their phone. They're seeing rape as this is what sex is. So no means try harder or don't take no for an answer. They're not learning the appropriate boundaries or anything because of because of this online thing. We haven't had to deal with this before. Prior to COVID, it was pretty bad, just internet alone. And then when COVID happened and everybody was stuck at home, it just it just was like a wildfire. Just the sexual online exploitation was just wildfire. Now it got a little bit better, but we have a lot to do, a lot of policies and procedure changes that we need to make in order to keep our kids safe. So is it getting better? Um, No, it it is um, very, very bad right now. Prior to um, COVID, the Atlantic Magazine said, journal said, we have a pandemic. Before we even like knew what a pandemic, you know, what's a (laughs) pandemic? You know, the the sexual abuse of our children was at a level of pandemic. So much more has happened since then. It's the things are awful. Here's the good thing. This is not some mysterious cancer 
that we need to fundraise for um, you know, science, science, you know, science laboratories to figure out why and what we can do. We don't have to like experiment on animals to see what medicines work. We, it's access. It's access. And we, that is our greatest power is that we can prevent access. It's so simple. It, it is, it's so simple. In order to sexually abuse a child, you need, you need somebody who has the inclination to abuse. And the theories on that are somebody is either abusing because they're, a, they have the, um, they're a pedophile. Um, that, that's just their, incl that's their sexual inclination is children, you know, um, or they are doing like it's, it could be a kid who is reenacting what was done to him or her to another child. The second thing is a vulnerable, a, a vulnerable child. And there are greater vulnerabilities. I don't usually talk about that because I don't want anybody to feel like they're safe because they're white. They're safe because they're not in the system. They're safe because they're middle income and not poverty stricken. Really, all children, all children are vulnerable. Um, the third thing is, and this is our most powerful thing, is access. Does that person have access to that vulnerable child? The Boy Scouts learned the hard way. The Catholic Church learned the hard way. They were forced to hire a third party administrator to create policies and procedures. Some churches most have policies and procedures. Most do not. There's, there's the limited little thing that insurance makes, but that's it. So just policies and procedures similar to the ones with the Catholic Church and the Boy Scouts. You're not allowed to um, take a child by themselves for an overnight if you're, you know, if you're the camp counselor or you're the band teacher. You know, you can't save money and share a room with your student. <laughs> You know, you know, um, you can't send stuff back and forth. You have to have a second person, two adults, always two adults. So there's policies and procedures that we can put into place. And parents, parents learning how to communicate with the other parents for sleepovers. We're doing a, a, a five hour conference June 8th um, here in Maine. It's called Parenting Safe Children. Her name is Feather and she works out of Colorado and she is a phenomenal educator teaching parents how do you how do you keep your kids safe? People so spend more time. This, but if you look at all of this, yep. um, um, there's always been abuse of children. I mean, you were abused before, you were sex trafficking before um, the internet. So, yeah. um, there is, do you think the generational problem of it has gotten worse? Do you think that the pornography that's online is creating more of an inclination for wanting to have sex with children, wanting to abuse children? Um, no, what? I don't. I don't think that there is a greater desire. I think that there is greater access and okay. the and the greater, greater temptation i think that if you um if you are somebody that loves i don't know what um i i like i like chocolate ice cream so um if you love chocolate ice cream and it's hard to get you're only going to get that chocolate ice cream you know right whenever but if it's everywhere you know and so and they can get away with it. And that's the thing. People who um, who are inclined to abuse children are looking for vulnerable children. They're looking for a way to get away with it. So I don't think that there's more people, like there's a greater amount of people who want to abuse. I just think that they can, they have greater opportunity and and because of the internet, because of the busy lives, because of not being educated, because of not having policies and procedures in place within our families, within our organizations, within our faith-based organizations, 
they're getting access to the to the kids. And I think it's such an interesting way of angling it for access. And I think you're so right, because my brother's kids in Norway, I remember I was with them at the beach and they were wearing these really tops and they were sharing it online. And my brother says, don't share that online because you're making yourself vulnerable to um, to the predators. And the girls were not really listening. They thought, oh, dad is so old fashioned. And I said the same thing. Do you realize what you're doing? And it was almost like having aunt, the cool aunt, <laughs> say this made them realize they didn't show themselves anymore and my brother had to shock them with some sex trafficking videos to tell them you've yeah. got to take this seriously and i think uh the peer pressure of the kids today you're absolutely right it's a really it's a really tough thing uh to see do you think parents are getting more and more aware of the access component is that a message that you're seeing becoming more infiltrated or is it not as much. How old are your are your um, nieces? What age group? I'm sorry. What are the ages of your nieces? My nieces at the time when I was doing that, they were 12 to 16. Yeah. So that that 10 to 12 spot is is particularly um, there's a that's a tough one that that age. So. Um, I want to commend you for saying something. So what you did is exactly right. So if everybody just spoke up, you know, just spoke up when your gut says something, when you see something, hey, girls, you know, there are there are people out there that um, are not going to have your best interest at heart and they're going to, you know, you need to not do that. Um, you just saying something, being the cool aunt, like you said, boy, you're the one that said something. Wow, if she's saying something, right? So um, I just wanted to commend you. That was, that oh, was, great. Yeah, that was no. great, very cool of you to do that. Um, I'm kind of the old fashioned aunt. I'm like, dude, don't dress like that. You're just making it worse. And I just remember that when I was young myself, you know, as soon as you wear the short skirts, it's like you're ready for the taking it's when you are dressed more respectable you're treated more respectable right and but so the you, fashions you, today is just really tough for the kids you you say that but that's not that is not the um that's not the bait so really? we we would think that right we would think no. wow you you're you're looking like you're easy for a back lack of a better word you look like you're easy so i'm going to go for you because you're easy when really um i'll give you an example of what a potential offender could do so um, back in my day you know if you got to go to the mall and hang out with your girlfriends you were really cool so uh friday night you could be roller skating rink could be the mall so there's a, a group of girls and we'll say um you know 12 um 10 11 12 or you know 10 to 13 that sort of age 14 maybe 15 and the girls are out at the mall and they're they're all dressed up and they're having fun an offender could be watching them right and he's trying or she he or she is trying to pick which one is potentially um a good a good uh good for him so he might bump into them bump into a particular girl and then he'll say oh excuse me and then he'll look into her eyes and say you have the most beautiful blue eyes if she says thank you i got them from my dad and like scurry off that's one response or she looks down and she says um i'm not very pretty had nothing to do with what she was wearing it was vulnerability the one that looked down and said i'm not very pretty that's going to be a much easier prey than the confident girl who said i got my eyes from my dad no wow. that's just an example of stranger when really it is the you know, the cheerleading coach, the swim coach, the camp counselor, the friend of the family, the neighbor, the parent or relative of your child's friends. You know, they, they do a sleepover and the husband and wife has a brother that comes over or, you know, and they groom the girls. It's like the frog that you put in the, in the cool water and turn up the heat 
or the frog. So people use stranger danger. Well, that's kind of like throwing the frog in the hot water. Run, you know, white van, right? But the other one is sl so slow and insidious. You know, they, they make the child more at their own level. So it's like, you know, you really under So, um, uh, you know, Susie, you understand me so well. I wish you were older. If you were older, I would marry you and make. So it's like that Disney um, romance fairy tale thing. Um, if I were your boyfriend, Susie, I would treat you like a queen. You know, they they do these things. Can I tell you a problem? Wow, you're so smart. Nobody understands the love that we have for each other. I wait for you until you get older, blah, blah, blah. Like they, they are geniuses. They know what's at stake. They know they're not supposed to have sex with the child. They are going to do or say or whatever they need to. And they could groom, that's what they call it, grooming, for a year before this actual sexual contact. And it's more than one person. So they've got that going on with Susie, but they also have Mary and Linda and, and, and Trudy down the street that they're at different levels with. The average assaults for um, a, an offender is 150 times in an average offender's career of sexually abusing. That's not even, you know, somebody who's prolific. That's just the average is 150 times. Wow. So there's, there's a lot to it. And of course, parents, I was just talking about this earlier, like, you know, nobody wants to take time to learn about this, or, you know, they, they might do like what they think is enough. I remember somebody telling me, Catherine, because of you, I told my husband and I told our five year old that if something doesn't feel good, you come and tell mommy and daddy. And they, she was all proud. Like they had that conversation. And I said, well, what are you going to do when it feels good? You know, wow. and her jaw hit, you know, because it does. And if you, and if the, the parents who say, you know, I'm going to string up if I saw, uh, you know, uh, um, somebody that has sex with a child, you know, that I would kill them and blah, blah, blah. Well, the children around you that hear you talking that way about the awful things that you would do to somebody who had sex with children, if they're in a intimate relationship with somebody, if they're being sexually abused by somebody in the family and they love that person, they trust that person, they just want that person to stop having sex with them, but they don't want anything bad to happen because children are ferociously loyal. Like they will let anything happen to them. An offender can say, I'm going to do these awful things to you and you're going to shut up and let me or I'm going to do them to your baby brother or your sister. That child will endure hell for years and never say anything out of loyalty to their siblings. So it seems like to me that there is there is actually two issues here, really. In more, There's so, so many. There's so but, many. But we're going to tackle it so people don't feel like so helpless that nothing is really happening, right? So there is the issue of what's always happened. It's the family member that does this. It's the coach, the people yeah. that you're actually seeing in real life. Yeah. So they have the same access and possibly more with possibly the internet, but you really have the analogs situation that's always happened, right? And then you have the internet which then and social media which makes it 10 times worse because the people the coaches that only had the face-to-face -face can now utilize the axis of the social media to right. be even darker in the way that they're doing and to make it okay so they can show so they can show scenes from movies from right. from things on tiktok and say look they're doing it, so it's okay for you and I to do it. So the, so we got the story down, but 
to not make this so hopeless, because now I feel really hopeless. Like I feel like there's nothing that would actually help in this situation. And, and you're dealing a lot with having to get people like you did with the starfish. How, how and what in the 12 years that you've worked, what has really been the success factor that has helped in the areas that you've worked in? Um, okay. Where the so that, so the, the, the best thing has been educating people on ACEs. So adverse childhood experiences. So if your listeners Google adverse childhood experiences, they will see at the very top um, is the CDC. So back in the 80s, the Kaiser Permanente in the 80s is when people started um, really having morbid obesity, not like a little voluptuous chunky, but like morbidly obese. And so uh, Kaiser Permanente, it's all about money, right? So they were losing money, their profits, because these morbidly obese people were having these various um, medical conditions. They were having blood pressure stuff, heart stuff, blood sugar stuff. Um, and so they were losing their profits. So they decided they were going to create a weight loss program so they could get the weight under control. They would alleviate a lot of these after effects of obesity and they would save profits and they would be the heroes of, of their, um, of their medical group. So this is uh, Northern uh, California Kaiser Permanente, sort of like um, they would sell insurance to big companies. So all their employees and the employee's family would go through sort of like herding cattle through this HMO. So they do the program and it's successful. Um, people lose weight. They're awesome. They're, you know, high fiving. And then a percentage, and I don't know what the percentage was off the top of my head, but a percentage gained the weight back. And the doctors were like, well, how could this be? Our program's fantastic. Our program works. There must be something wrong with you. And we're going to prove that there's something wrong with you and not our program. We're going to send out a survey. And these are all mostly Caucasian people, mostly middle income that can afford insurance like Kaiser Permanente. And they get this survey. And the survey's like, um, is there anybody mentally ill living in your home? Is there food insecurity in your home? Is there domestic violence in your home? Has anybody been incarcerated in your home? Is there sexual abuse of any kind going on in your home? Um, these sorts of uh, questions. So they get the test results back again, mostly Caucasian, middle income, Northern California. And when they get the results, they're like, Houston, we have a problem. They were blown away. They said, if this is the result, if these survey questions, answers are what we're seeing from this demographic, then we need to let the federal government know. So they reached out to the Center for Disease Control, shared their findings, and they collaborated together to do a nationwide survey. And what they found was that children, and I'll, and I'll say in utero, so in utero through 18, you know, and that's sort of a gray line, but that time period, age, when a child is developing, it's kind of like a souffle, you can't put it in the oven, take it out, put it in the oven, take it out, it's not going to rise. Well, when you abuse children through neglect or abuse, and they, and they are living in growing up in an environment like this, they get these traumas. And so they gave a scale for each trauma. There was a, a scale of one. It was um, one. So if you have four out of, I think it was 10 at the time, I think the questions are now 22 questions, but at the time they were 10. If you had a score of four, well, what happens to your longevity of life, the physical symptoms, what they found was if they if the child cannot develop properly, there are these cause and effect, this ripple effect that happens that was mind blowing, mind blowing and so much money, a decrease in a lifespan, the higher the score by up to 20 years, greater heart attacks, greater 
like 92% of all the women who are incarcerated have a high A score. Then they took it even further and said, okay, again, it's about money. Let's look at all the hospitals. The hospitals lose money by what they call frequent flyers. People who are always coming into the emergency room over and over again, they're, they can't get their blood pressure under control. They can't get their blood sugar under control. Their pain medication isn't working the way it works for other people on them. They're having trouble. Well, guess what? High A scores. They found that high A scores, they were the frequent flyers. Let's take it to um, healthcare for companies. Again, it's all about money. How are they losing money? A company is affording healthcare for their employees based on usage. So 80% are using it like normal, you know, they get sick twice a year or whatever it is. But this other percentage, this 10% is using the lion's share of the healthcare costs for the whole organization because this 10% are always sick. They're coming in late. Their car broke down. Their kid has the flu. They're always, and we all know them. Like we've all, we all know who those people are. Ding, ding, ding. High A score. And so the, the biggest the thing is that. So what, so what are you saying then? Is that we focus on the A score? Is that what you're doing with U.S. trafficking? I'm, I'm saying that when people take a minute and do a deep dive and understanding ACEs for the last, this is again, my 12th year, when I explain ACEs and when yeah. people do their own research, their minds are blown. I can't tell ice you. Is amazing. It's an amazing. Most, I mean, most well, people don't. Amazing. Most people don't know about it. So it was Oprah. I want to say four years ago, but it's probably five years now. So uh, 60 Minutes had their 50th anniversary. So if you, if your listeners Google um, 60 Minutes Oprah, it'll pop up CBS, and it. So my husband was like, this can't be true because he just assumed that Oprah knows everything and she would have known about ACEs. <laughs> because the, the Kaiser Permanente was in the 80s and this was just a few years ago that Oprah's saying, I had no idea. So she wanted to do her segment of 60 Minutes on ACEs and 60 Minutes said, no, no, we don't wanna, that's, that's a Pandora's box, we don't wanna go there. And she said, I either get to talk about ACEs or I'm not gonna do the show. And then on NBC, her best friend Gail interviewed her and said, all these years, all the shows, all the people, all the self-help, I've never seen you like this. And Oprah said, I had no idea that instead of how could you do this thing, what happened to you? She said, every philanthropic thing from the moment I learned about ACEs on has been forever changed. So if... If people understand ACEs, the light switch goes on and they understand why their mom, their dad, their sibling, their crazy aunt, their crazy uncle, they can have some compassion for that and they can see why doing their own inner work, like the thing that trips them up, right? If they just did the thing that tripped them up, now from a from a, a more... Um, healthy perspective from that healthy perspective they can say okay my gut feeling is saying that something isn't right or maybe they have the confidence to be able to have those difficult conversations i mean you had a lot of confidence to say hey girls um you shouldn't be taking pictures like that and sharing them on, on public somebody else might not have the confidence to be that bold and say something like that oh i'm not the parent i'm not going to get involved screw that you're like hey you know i care about this kid and then when you also look at the fact that all children are our responsibility instead of i'm only going to look after mine and I'm only going to do what's comfortable for me because I haven't healed. So I have a lot of shame about my body. I have a lot of um, embarrassment about my parents didn't tell me things that hasn't been modeled for me. So I don't know what to say and how to say it. So I'm just not going to say I turned out fine and I didn't know anything. Right. So when you understand ACEs and you do your work, you're able to show up 
for your family and for your community in a healthier way and just do the starfish, just that one thing. And that changes everything. Yeah, I know. ICE has really changed my perspective. I thought it was a very interesting study and really made you look at your own traumas and why you're reacting the way you are and looking at the score. You're like, oh, I didn't realize this was going to have so much of a health impact on my life. Huge. And it's a good reminder. It's a good reminder. Um, so if you look at your life and you look at everything, you're really highlighting this issue. Where do you see the issue going now? Is it you're focusing on ACEs, you're focusing on on prevention and education. What what do you think is the big, or maybe not big, but this these small actions? How are you expanding and how is this just becoming known? Are just people just coming to you as a resource or is it um, like how how have you been developing and growing? So I started off just doing what I mentioned earlier, just being invited as a guest to be on a panel. And then from that place, I was invited to be like the keynote speaker for various groups, um, women's business, men's groups, all these different groups. And I come from a sales background. And whenever I wanted to close a sale with a, with a big company, I would always bring my A team. Right. So I know that the owner of the company is going to be there. The HR is going to be there. Their payroll person is going to be there. Their tax accountant is going to be there. And they're all going to have their own their own lane. And they're going to want to know what I'm selling them, how it's going to impact their particular focus. So I would bring in my A team that would be able to speak tax code, that would be able to speak HR so that I could meet them where they were at, answer the questions before they answered it, and close the deal. Mm -hmm. And I closed a lot of deals and was the top producing salesperson in the country for a decade. So now I'm being invited to be, you know, talk about sex trafficking, child sexual abuse and prevention. And I'm looking at my audience and sometimes I would have 150 people show up at a particular group. And I'm like, you know what? I think the same would apply. So I would bring in somebody from the world of addictions, somebody from the district attorney's office, somebody from Homeland Security, and then I would speak as a thriving survivor. So that way I could hit people wow. where they, where they were at. Great. Right? Yeah. So then that began to grow. And I'm like, okay, how can I reach even more people? So my singular goal, my target was how can I reduce the sexual abuse of children in the state of Maine? I believed I could have the greatest impact if I educated the 1.3 million people in the state of Maine. So how can I do that effectively and efficiently? So I said, okay, well, maybe if I spoke at conferences. So I went around to different conferences and I saw who their speakers were what they were saying, how were they saying it, because success leaves clues. And I realized I had an aha moment after I think my fourth, and I go to different states too. Um, after my fourth conference, I had an aha moment that said, these people are preaching to the choir. The people that they're talking to already know how bad the problem is. We need to get to the people who don't know. Well, how can I do that? Well, I'll have my own damn conference <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll invite all the people who don't get to go to them. Well, what are the blocks to that? Well, it's usually weekday. They're usually somewhere where they have to travel. They're usually very expensive. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have it on a Friday, Saturday, and I'm going to have it be free and I'm going to have it be an experience. I'm going to bring a food truck so they don't have to leave. And I'm going to have coffee and tea. I'm going to, I'm going to change their state when they walk in the door. I'm going to have acoustic guitar playing. So when they Tony come Robbins in, all the way, <laughs> right? I, this, is, this is how I roll, right? And so I reached out to somebody from the district attorney's office that I have the highest respect for. And she told me about Victor Veith. Victor Veith used to work for um, in our nation's capital as and he's also clergy and a lawyer but he was 
I'm the lawyer, crimes against children in D.C. for many years. He has an excellent reputation. He educates over 50,000 um, usually state workers across the United States. And, um, and she said, you need to talk to Victor. So I, I don't know how to do a dinner party like like Nora. Our, fr our mutual friends, Nor like she can do a dinner party. I don't know how to do How am oh, I going to do a conference? Like I'm like, how am I going to do a conference? So I reached out to Victor and I said, hey, I have no idea. He called me up and he said, I've never been to Maine. What's the, what's the best time of year? I said, September. And he said, this is what I think you should do and how I think you should do it. It was a three-day event for faith leaders and community. I raised $25,000, brought him in. We had 350 people. It was my first time ever doing an event, 75 um, police. And then another one we did online. We did a three-day conference for social workers, teachers, and prosecuting attorneys. We had 679 participants on that. So, um, and then I got a call from um, the Catholic diocese and they said, hey, we have 12 schools in Maine. The kids are sharing sexually explicit things. This is after COVID. We can't seem to get ahead of it. Could you teach online safety? These kids don't seem to understand that there's no such thing as delete when you share a picture. So we called it undeletable. And I brought in somebody from Victor. So Victor Vieth's company is, is called um, Zero Abuse Project. So we brought in somebody from his, his organization. We brought in Homeland Security. We brought, brought in local law enforcement. We had 350 children on the edge of their seat the first day. Wow. It was it was amazing. And then I got a call from Homeland Security. Homeland Security said, hey, um, you know, the stuff that we do, it's affecting us. And we need to understand vicarious trauma, how to deal with our own vicarious trauma so that we can do our jobs where, you know, addictions are going up, domestic violence is going up, divorce is going up, suicide is going up. Could you do it? But could you do it privately? Because we don't want this like we don't want people to see our faces. We don't want this to be on Facebook. Would you do this? So I got four um, four. Um, uh, highly qualified trainers educated in trauma. We were able to bring in the University of New Hampshire Crimes Against Children Research Lab, one of the world's foremost research labs. They volunteered to come and speak. I couldn't believe it. I was so excited. And we had we were all set up to do this day long, private, no cameras sort of thing. And then the state of Maine had our first and hopefully last mass shooting in Lewiston, Maine. The oh, day wow. that we were to have our conference, 350 law enforcement were on a manhunt trying to find the shooter. We were beside ourselves. What do we do? So the head guy of our local Homeland Security and another gentleman came to our, our building and said, record it, record it. We will put this out to every Homeland Security office. This will go out to every chief of police, like record it, we'll share it. Please don't not do it because we're all in Lewiston trying to find the shooter. So we did. And that's also on our YouTube and on our website. And that's called Courageous Resilience. And that has just been, every time we give the QR postcard to somebody as a first responder, fire chief, fireman, EMT, police officer, and you hand them that card and say, here's the link to be able to get to this training, their whole face changes and you would have thought I was giving them a glass of water on a, you know, when they were dehydrated. They were just like, thank you. Thank you. Such a need for that. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm one person and you're seeing me in my she shed. So I have a little <laughs> she shed beside my house. One person, 12th year, amazing impact. Now, what could an organization what could an organization, a well-funded organization do? If a short old crazy chick in a she shed can get this kind of training, you know, going 
12th year. What yeah, but I'm gonna stop you there. I'm gonna stop you there because you're not a crazy old she shed. You're like this kick ass, sexy woman that does oh my body God. that is absolutely amazing. Uh you have taken every step of the way. I think in life tragedy happens to most of us, right? I um was through 9-11, so that was kind of a hard thing for me. And yeah. we all what happens to you happens for you and you work through yeah. it. And I think really what you've done is you've really worked yourself through and really you are the message. So the reason why people are coming to you is because you are the message. You are thriving. You are a role model. You are a reminder. And uh, I think all of that in itself, you embody what people want to hear and follow. So you're not the crazy old lady. Well, thank, you. <laughs> thank you for that. You know, the, the thing is, is I would not be who I am or where I am if it wasn't for the grace of God. So I believe, you know, awful things happened. I did my work. I kept moving forward from a, from a selfish place. You know, I just didn't want to suffer anymore. I did my work because I didn't want to suffer. I wanted to be, I wanted to be happy. And when I was a mom, I needed to learn how to be a good mom, which meant I needed to be, you know, I needed to heal myself. And then I needed to learn how to be a good mom. And then in business, I needed to learn. I called it getting up to zero. How long do you shake somebody's hand before it's weird? How do you, you know, how do you do interpersonal? I didn't go to high school. So I had to take classes. You know, I took, gosh, oh my gosh, I have so many classes, interpersonal communication, conflict resolution, you know, so many, so many things. I love Tony Robbins. I've, I used to be university on wheels. I'm driving all over the United States and I'm listening to stuff on how to be a better person. So the whole stop trafficking us was, um, my effort to be in service in thanks to God for this amazing life that I have. You know, I wake up every day on a lake in Maine and watch the sunrise. I've gotten to have almost all of my bucket list things, you know, glider plane over Arcadia National Park Peak Fall, California, you know, doing the, um, the paragliding over the cliffs, hot air balloon in, in Arizona, my friendships, I've got the coolest, most wonderful, interesting women friends. My children are all healthy and happy and thriving. Like I am so incredibly blessed. So I wanted to serve. I wanted to give back so that victims could learn from me that you have to do your work. It doesn't, it's not just like positive thinking. You have to, you know, there's a lot you have to do to heal and move and and to thrive but it's it's doable like the stuff that we talk about the work you have to do well it works and i'm an example of that it works so i wanted to give them hope that you can indeed thrive regardless of where you've come from and i also wanted to educate in an effort to stop other children from going through what i went through i don't I don't want any child to go through what I've gone through. And now I'm wrapping things up. So November, um, I'm a, I, the, I work with the state of, of Maine. They asked me to, um, to be a keynote speaker. So I'll be speaking to about 600 teachers in August. And then November, I'll be speaking to the state of Maine corrections. I've got three different programs that I'm bringing to this to the state of Maine. Senator Susan Collins gave me a three hundred thousand dollar grant um, for my child sexual abuse prevention conferences. So we just did a two day conference for faith leaders in Portland. We're doing another one in August in Augusta. We're doing another one in Caribou, which is the Canadian border in September. So um, there's a lot of trainings and stuff that I'm doing. And then in November, I am closing up shop. I feel like 12 years, um, no paycheck. I've never taken a paycheck for the work that I do. Um, I'm ready to for the next chapter. I don't know where the Holy Spirit's going to lead me on the next chapter, but I feel complete. 
I feel like I went through it. I healed it. I gave back. And I don't know what the next chapter is, but I just turned 60. And it's time for me to, to do something else. So I And I feel really complete and good. And I hope that other people out there keep doing this work because it needs to be done. But I've done my part. And I'm good with that. That's fantastic. I think that's a good ending for the podcast. You, you suffered, you healed, you gave. Yeah. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And now you're going to go on to the next level of what you're mm -hmm. going to do and enjoy life. And mm -hmm. uh, it's so I've just seen you. We've known each other. We have mutual friends and just seen the light that you shine. And not not just on the um, on the sex trafficking, but I think you embody excellence in anything you do, just like your bodybuilding, really yeah. the sense of excellence that you just take on in every step of your life. And I think that is something we can really be role models to. That's important, you know, for, for me, you know, I, if I'm going to do something, I, I want to think beyond the reality of who's trying to do it. <laughs> you know, when I'm, uh, the bodybuilding, you know, I wasn't looking at the short old people competing. I was looking at, you know, the world class and I said, okay, who are short? world class and I am fortunate enough to have placed in the top four of every competition I've participated in. So that was really cool. And I feel good about this. And I, I don't know what the next chapter is going to be, but, um, but I know it's going to be super cool, but I don't know what it is. Of course it is. Cause you're going to excel at the highest level, which you always do. And that's what makes that makes what you've done up until now become known and make an impact on the world. And and uh, I just want to thank you for your service. And I think where we can find you as the website, U.S. Stop Trafficking, is, and we will have all the links in the yeah. show notes yeah. for you to highlight. And uh, and I want you to show the award that you got. I think that's oh. the most beautiful thing we have to see at the end. I love this. So Ruchira Gupta is this amazing Indian woman who was, um, lives in New York too, but she was in India and she was a photojournalist and she was taking pictures of little villages. And she went to this one village and the girls were gone. All the little girls were gone. And wow. most people would have said, back up slowly, get the hell out of here. And she didn't, she took her camera and she said, I wanna know where they went. And she filmed the whole thing and it was an award. I think she got an Emmy or whatever for this documentary. And the Clinton saw it and the, the sex traffickers came and took all of the girls and took them um, 50 miles away. And it would look like a horse trough, like a barn with these stables and with a piece of plywood and one blanket and a locked door and a little window and put the wimp, the girls in each one and just sent men in and men and men and men and men. And she documented the whole thing. And uh, she came back and the Clintons talked to her and they worked together. She was the first non-American citizen to work on a national bill. So it was pretty, pretty cool. Ruchira Gupta, um, so she came to the state of Maine um, to spoke at Colby, spoke at Bates, and they asked if I, one of the first things I did in 2015, if I would be on a panel with her. And so she and I connected. She's been following my work all these years. And this last fall, she said, Catherine, I want to honor you with the last girl award in New York. So that's what... Um, that's what that is. So she is the grandmother of the um, sex trafficking prevention movement. So it's super, super cool that um, she gave that to me. Well deserved, my friend. Yeah. Well deserved. In all your life, if you're going to think about what are what are like, what do you want to be remembered by? What I want to be remembered by. Well, I'm hoping I can. Um, I sent you the link of my life story in a, in a YouTube. I think it's a four hour YouTube and it's my life story. And if um, I want people to have hope, you know, I want people 
regardless of what they've been through, the bringer of hope, you know, that's, um, that's important to me. My favorite word I think is kindness. You know, I want to be remembered for, for being kind and the bearer of hope. Mm -hmm. When I did date with destiny, you know, I wanted to have the Christ mind. I wanted to be a conduit of, of that loving kindness on the planet. You know, I wanted to be a beacon of, of education and hope and compassion for the world that, you know, with, with, with boundaries, you know, you can have compassion and still have boundaries. I'm not talking a door, you know, a doorstep, doormat. <laughs> doormat. Yeah. I don't want to be a doormat, but just, you know, Hey, everybody has a story. Nobody's perfect. Let's, let's work together. Let's collaborate instead of compete. Let's collaborate and lift each other up and make the world a better place because we can, because we can. And you've proven it. My well, friend. you too. You've Look at it. you. How many people have you made famous? You know? <laughs> well, I hope uh, my goal is for this podcast is for more and more people to know about this important issue about the work that you've done, learn about the website and, and we'll also put in the link if it's okay, your biography, your four hour YouTube so that people can look at that yeah. and really take on what one person can do. Even having in, in, in the face of aces, if you're thinking of it, the, yeah. the, the statistics they're showing how difficult it is, but we can, we can overcome. And that's what well, you're showing. Well, yeah. The, so the um, the United Way of Southern Maine um, asked if I would um, apply for this grant. Um, we, I'll know in the next couple of days if we if we got the grant. It's sixty thousand dollars, and they're trying to decrease suicide in Southern Maine. So um, I'm working with my team, and where we put together an online platform. So we can't have more. You know, I can't. It's what it's what can you do, right? So I can't. The state of Maine has, um, in the all of the United States, the state of Maine has the worst reputation. Our our, our um, numbers are greater than anybody else, two by two by two. Wow. So uh, of of how children are treated all over the United States, and they base that on a lot of things. Um, the state of Maine is the worst. So there's nothing that I can do from my she shed for that. I can't offer more resources. I don't, I can't have a house. Like I can, I can, I can't, but what can I do? I can have something online that they can take the test. They can take the ACEs test. They can take the depression scale. They can have, they can put in their physical information and a personalized exercise program for them weight bearing only so they don't need a gym they can be based on their score on anxiety and depression they can go to different resources that are available you know there wasn't um i had myself like i would tap into tony uh, tony robbins i would tap into gary zukoff i would tap into brian weiss i would tap in i did that on my own well all of that's collected and so people can log on and they can go to that themselves and if i do get this grant then that money will go toward making that even better so people can have hope so people can have hope that's the thing. So if your listeners, if they did their own ACE test, right? And if they did their own work, that in and of itself is all they have to do to make a difference in the world. Remember the Indian and, he, and he's standing on that pile of, of trash, right? And the little tear is coming down. Well, nobody's going to pick up all of that trash he was standing on. But if everybody picked up one piece the mountain would be cleared. So just do your one piece. I love that. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. And um, we'll have all of the links in the show notes so that you can take on and help and support. I hope there's like a funding link so people can fund and help support you there is, as well. They can do yeah, they can, they can donate on the, on the website. But right. really, if they did anything, it would just be 
you know, learn about ACEs because that that will touch them personally and that will make such a difference in their own world. And I just want to help them make a difference in their own world. We will do that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for listening to Become Famous Podcast. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, rate, and review our show. Your support helps us keep bringing you valuable insights on achieving fame in your industry. Keep shining and see you next time. Thank you.